So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us tonight. Hopefully you will walk away with some new knowledge, some new skills, um, and it'll inspire you to get out and go fishing. Uh, again, I am Sunshine Loveless with Outdoor Chattanooga. Just so you guys know, Outdoor Chattanooga is a unique division within the city of Chattanooga. We promote all things outdoors within about an hour's drive of city center. We encourage and inspire people to get outside, spend more time recreating and playing in our scenic city. Um, it serves both as well-being as well as an economic driver um, for the city itself. So thank you so much for finding us, for being with us tonight. Uh, looks like we have about 37 people signed in joining us, which is awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. Um, Richard is the owner and lead adventure guide for Scenic City Fishing Charters, which is a local fishing operation here in Chattanooga. He was kind enough to join us this evening to offer his expertise on all things fish in the Southeast region. Uh, I am not an expert, so I hope to learn some things with you guys tonight. Um, again, we are in a webinar format. If you have questions, feel free to put them in that Q&A. We will save them up and answer them at the end. Uh, Richard's gonna go through a quick little um, presentation and then have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And then one more time, just because I've seen a few more uh, people join us, we're up to 39 participants. Uh, check out the chat, fill out that sign-in sheet. Uh, you'll receive an Outdoor Chattanooga sticker as well as be entered into the drawing for the Sportsman's Warehouse gift card. Um, thank you so much guys for being here tonight. Richard, thank you for being here tonight and providing your expertise. I'm gonna kind of be the moderator. Uh, I'm Sunshine with Outdoor Chattanooga. And I will um, interject if I need to, help share screens if I need to, but otherwise I think now is an appropriate time to turn it over to you, so. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, so I, I know it's somewhat unpleasant to have to sit there and uh, stare at me. So I'm gonna be switching to a PowerPoint uh, here that kind of helps guide me along and uh, Keeps you all from having to look at me. And uh, real quick, I'm going to one more time in the chat function for those that ask, where's the sign in sheet? If you hover your screen over the uh, video, um, it should pull up a little menu bar at the bottom. There is a chat. Click on that. It'll open up kind of how we've been communicating leading up to the workshop. And then a Q&A, which is where you can enter your que questions specifically for Richard tonight. All right, Richard, take it away. Uh, Sunshine's already given you the rundown. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this slide again a little bit later, but in the meantime, for right now, if anybody wants to uh, make note of our contact information, you feel free. Um, and, and just so you know, that email address, I get tons of calls and tons of email questions, people just asking about fishing and guidance. And so obviously we like to book clients for fishing trips, but I am always happy to help anybody I can anytime you want uh, in, if you have fishing questions. So don't hesitate to contact me. I also wanna thank Sportsman's Warehouse for uh, helping us out tonight by donating a couple of $25 gift cards that uh, somebody at the end of this presentation is going to have the opportunity to win. And uh, without further ado, we'll start walking through here. Um, quick overview of what we're going to cover here. We're going to go over the major species of fish here that people fish for. Uh, there's four or five main ones. We got a lot of species in Tennessee River, but there's four or five that the majority of people fish for. We'll give you a quick overview of some local places that you can fish. Uh, this is primarily for people who may not have a boat and need to know where they can go bank fishing or fish from shore, uh, whether you've got a boat or not. <coughs> I want to spend the most of tonight on a question and answer session. I don't want to sit here and lecture at you. 
uh, you know, I don't think you want that either. Uh, so we're going to want to know what you want to know by putting those questions uh, into the chat option that Sunshine was telling you about. But before we get there, um, I want to know more about who's out there. So Sunshine is going to put up four quick survey questions that we want each of you to answer. And that's going to give me a, a better idea uh, of who's out there. So Sunshine, you go ahead with those survey questions if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, guys, you should see this pop up on your screen. You feel free to pick the answer that best suits you. So the first polling question we have tonight is what is your favorite species to fish for? We'll leave that up for a few seconds. Um, getting a lot of people voting. I love it. Um, we're up to about 79%, 81% have voted. Do you have a guess, Richard, what you think the answer is going to be? Oh, uh, God, that's a hard question. Um, what do you find people will just, ba just based upon, you know, what we're going to talk about here, I'm going to say bass fishing. Uh, but uh, I think crappie is going to rank real high. And uh, depending upon the level of the crowd we got out there, bluegill might be in there as well. All right. Looks like somebody entered their own since it wasn't on the list. But I've got about 91% voted. We've kept this up for a minute. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Your guess was right. Uh, we had 37% prefer largemouth bass. 10% smallmouth bass, 20% crappy, crappy. Again, I'm not the fishing expert, guys. That's all up to Richard. We have 15% with catfish, 5% bluegill, and 15% other. It looks like a few people entered in the chat. Uh, one person said trout, and another said they like to catch anything. And it looks like somebody didn't see the poll pop up. Um, Audrey, hopefully we can make that work for you in the next one, okay? I'll, it should just pop up right on your screen. Uh, hopefully, you're, if you're on mobile, that might be a little difficult, but um, on desktop, you should be able to see it. Um, all right, let's go to the next poll question. Um, where do you primarily fish from, a boat or from the bank? Here comes the poll. All right, you guys should be able to see that on your screen now. Lots of votes coming through. You guys are much faster on, on this one. All right, Richard, we got about 93% voted. I have mostly from the bank. I'm gonna end this and share it. All right, looks like 36% can afford a boat, have a boat, go out on a boat, and 64% fish from the bank. Is that kind of what you figured? Um, I, I really had no idea on this one, and uh, but I'm not surprised by it because that's probably the, one of the most common questions I get from people is, you know, I don't have a boat. I want to know where I can go fishing from the shore. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. And is either one better than the other? Um, you've got a lot more flexibility and options with a boat, but obviously, uh, it's, that's just not the cards for everybody. Yeah. All right, guys, here's our third question tonight. Um, what do you prefer to use in, as far as lures go? What is your preferred lure, artificial lure or live cut bait? All right, about 90% votes in, 95. All right, I think that's good. That is a very, very close call, Richard. 45% to 55%. Yeah, and again, that doesn't surprise me because, uh, you know, when you're fishing from the shore, uh, in most cases, fishing with bait, uh, is is going to be more 
uh, proficient or efficient. And uh, but uh, there's a lot of folks who fish the artificials from shore as well. Yeah. So the last survey question is. Final survey question. What do you do most often with your catch? Do you catch and release or do you keep and eat it? And I love that we have so many people that have, are attending tonight that actually do fish. So they're able to answer these questions. I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what my favorite species of fish is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got about 93% of the votes in, 95% at 30 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and end this. Thank you guys so much for participating. This is awesome. We have 70% that catch and release and only 30% that keep and eat their catch. Yeah, catch and release is uh, getting more and more popular, at, at, especially among the bass crowd. Uh, so, uh, that gives me a great idea of uh, who's out there. It's just going to help me a little bit in where I focus. But again, the real focus is going to be on your questions and answers. But for right now, uh, let's, uh, let's just hit some highlights on the major species. Um, <clears throat> as most people here, majority like fish for largemouth bass. It is by far the most popular species pursued by area anglers. Uh, according to the most recent reliable survey data, it says 36% of the people spend most of their days targeting bass. But of course, in, in our survey, it came up 37%. Um, but uh, I dare say that percentage is, is actually probably a little bit higher because this survey data was a few years old. Um, one reason bass is so popular around here since the year 2000, the Wildlife Agency has been stocking Florida strain largemouth bass. They're genetically larger and therefore our bass in Chickamauga Lake have, have, are growing bigger. Uh, and it's, it's become one of the most desirable best bass fisheries in the United States. You drive through a boat launching ramp on a busy weekend and you're going to see a ton of license plates from out of state. Uh, <clears throat> the picture there is uh, Gabe Keen uh, with the current state record largemouth bass caught from Chickamauga Lake in February 2015. Uh, he broke a state record that had been in place for 60 years. Uh, and Keen, along with a whole bunch of other people, think there's a bigger one out there waiting to be caught. <clears throat> Smallmouth bass. <clears throat> if you fish up on Chickamauga Lake, upstream from Chickamauga Dam, most of the bass you find are going to be largemouth bass. They're the predominant species. But if you go downstream from Chickamauga Dam, down toward downtown Chattanooga, you're probably gonna find more smallmouth bass because they prefer rocky habitat and current, whereas where largemouth aren't very, uh, they don't like current a whole lot. So mostly downstream from the dams where you're going to find the best uh, smallmouth fishing. Our water is managed by the State Wildlife Agency as trophy smallmouth water. That means you're only allowed to keep one smallmouth per day per person, and it has to be a minimum of 18 inches long. That's going to be about a three-pound smallmouth. So the bottom line is, they're they they're not the greatest reproducers in the world, and uh, so uh, they we we want them to get big. So they've got a pretty strict creel limit on smallmouth. Smallmouth fishing is always best in the cold weather months, which is sort of opposite to the largemouth. When water temperatures get above 70 degrees, then smallmouth, they disappear. I don't know where they go, but they disappear. <laughs> you know, people call us to book a smallmouth trip in July, and I tell them, nope, sorry, we can't do it because we don't want to take you fishing if we're not comfortable catching what you want to catch. And in the hot summertime, we have a hard time catching smallmouth bass. 
Catfish, this is my bread and butter. It's what I love. Uh, years and years ago, catfish were considered trash fish, but that's been changing dramatically over the years. Now, about 29% of their anglers in Tennessee say they primarily pursue catfish. We've got three species, blue catfish, channel catfish, and flatheads. Uh, blue cats are by far the most common, channel cats next, and in our area, uh, you catch a few flatheads. Um, blue catfish grow larger than any other fish in the Tennessee River. On rare occasions, they'll exceed 100 pounds. I'm a, and, and I'll show you a picture of one of those later, uh, probably. Um, and that's the reason I like fishing for them so much because when you get a bite, you never know what size fish you're gonna have on the end of the line. The state record blue catfish on a rod and reel is 112 pounds. The record for a blue catfish uh, caught in a commercial fishing net is 130 pounds. Crappie. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of, I, I got a couple here I'm going to show you. We have two species of crappie. Uh, as far as how they eat, size limits, all that, not much difference. But a lot of people just like to know biologically the difference. Um, it's a white crappie on the left and a black crappie on the right of your screen, that is. Um, <clears throat> Years and years ago, white crappie were predominant in Chickamauga Lake, uh, but as the lake grew older and the habitat changes, now black crappie are the most abundant. 20% <clears throat> of fishing uh, days in Tennessee are people pursuing specifically crappie. Uh, again, that's really variable. And in truth, cat fishing and crappie fishing probably run pretty close together. <clears throat> In our area, the size limit, a crappie has to be at least 10 inches long. Doesn't matter if it's a white crappie or a black crappie, but it has to be at least 10 inches long for you to keep it. And each angler is allowed to keep 15 per day. Um, and crappie, everybody talked about catch and release. Not too many people catch and release crappie because they're one of the most delectable, the best eating fish we have in our water. Uh, and uh, most people that catch keeping size crappie, legal size crappie, they're going to take them home and eat them. <clears throat> Bluegill. I could probably ask, you know, every one of you on here right now, what was the first fish you ever caught? And I'd be willing to bet the overwhelming majority would say bluegill. They're the most prolific, the most common, and the easiest to catch fish <clears throat> in our area. Um, and they don't get big, you know, that one in that picture right there is probably about an average size. And But if you're fishing with light tackle, small fishing rods, small lines, they're a lot of fun because uh, pound for pound for their size, they fight hard. <clears throat> These days, relatively few anglers in the grand scheme of things specifically target bluegill. Um, they say about 16% uh, people out there specifically fish for bluegill. Now, one thing about bluegill is you can catch them while you're fishing for other stuff. So just because that's the number targeting them, just about everybody is catching them, whether that's what they're fishing for specifically or not. <clears throat> We've got at least six other sunfish species in our water. Uh, red ear sunfish, a lot of people know them as shell crackers, or green sunfish, pumpkin seed. Uh, there's several others um, that uh, a lot of people collectively call them brim or bluegill. But we've actually got at least seven different species of sunfish uh, but bluegills by far the most common. <clears throat> There's no limit on bluegill. Um, you can catch and keep all you want. And that's because they're so prolific, reproduce so well that uh, you, bottom line, you can catch all you want to clean. There is a 20 fish per day limit on shell crackers, however. That's the red ear sunfish or shell crackers. 
So it is important to learn the difference. If you're out there catching a bunch sometime, uh, you got to keep up with the number of shell crackers that you're catching. Uh, in this picture, this gentleman in the left of your screen in his right hand is a bluegill. And in his left hand or the right of your screen is a red ear sunfish, also known as a shell cracker. You can see in this one, it's pretty easy to see the difference because you see on that, that his blue gill plate, which is also called an operculum, he's got a little red line around it, hence the name red ear. So learn how to identify those so you don't happen to catch too many of them. <clears throat> Where to fish? This is what a lot of you are here for. A lot of questions I get from people all the time is, I don't have a boat, where can I go bank fishing? I'm gonna tell you the general places that I direct people to more often than not. <clears throat> Harrison Bay State Park. Uh, there is lots and lots of access, shoreline access. You can see all the sloughs and bays there around Harrison Bay State Park, which actually extends way up above uh, my little red circle uh, and that's a great place to fish from the shore you can find a variety of different habitats and uh, access to the water uh, so it's just a good place to go you got a lot of options plus you've got a lot of other amenities of the state park around directly across Chickamauga Lake over on the Hickson side is Chester Frost State Park a lot of people are familiar with Chester Frost. <clears throat> a lot of people call that big embayment there, uh, Chester Frost. It's also known as Dallas Bay. Um, and in and around Chester Frost Park is a excellent place to uh, fish from the shoreline. Uh, downstream, uh, back on the east side of the river is Booker T. Washington. Um, Booker T. Washington has a excellent uh, fishing pier. Now, all these places have fishing piers. I don't always recommend fishing from the fishing piers, but I know Booker T fishing piers, really good place to fish. Uh, it actually has a cover on it. So even if it's raining, you want to go fish off a fishing pier somewhere, even if it's raining, Booker T's got a great uh, fishing pier. Uh, downstream is the Hubert Fry fishing park, uh, which is, of course, part of the Tennessee River Walk. And of course, they have excellent fishing piers that extend out into the river. Um, now, sometimes it can be challenging fishing down there because you've always got lots of current. Uh, so often it requires different techniques when you're fishing down there. But, uh, but it's a fine place to go. A lot of fish are caught there. There's one of the fishing piers that's immediately under that bridge that you see right in the middle of the circle. So if you go there on a rainy day or even a sunny day and people trying to find some shade, that fishing pier underneath that bridge is really popular. You better get there early to get a spot on it. Now, all of that said, <clears throat> there is good fishing from the shore anywhere you can legally get to the shore. You know, whether it's private landowner, if you can get to the water, there's a good chance you can catch fish there. So you see a lot of other green areas up and down the river there. That's public access. One place right under the red circle for around Harrison Bay State Park, you see where there's a creek that goes back in there and Highway 58 goes over that creek. Uh, that's called Wolf Teaver Creek. And underneath that bridge, uh, there at Wolf Teaver Creek, the, the Highway 58 bridge, that's, that's a super popular fishing spot. And it's actually a great place to catch crappie, uh, especially in the spring, starting in late February, going through April. Um, a lot of times crappie are moving off the main part of the lake and they're wanting to move back into the creek. Uh, to spawn and they have to funnel through that underneath that bridge to get there. So you frequently and often have crappie funneling in and out underneath that bridge. Uh, and that's true of a lot of bridge. 
bridges. You know, when you go up to Soddy Creek or Possum Creek, uh, any of the creeks up and down Chickamauga Lake, uh, feeder creeks coming from the main river channel are usually good places to crappie fish. Um, okay, techniques. Now I told Sunshine, she said she was kind of interested in, uh, you know, learning some fishing techniques, but I am not going to try to go through techniques. They are so varied. They're dependent upon the species you're fishing for. They're dependent upon the season, the time of year, dependent upon where you're fishing, dependent upon the kind of equipment you have. So I am not going to try to hit uh, every technique or, or, or a bunch of techniques out there. We want to I want to do that via your questions. So like we said, use the chat option. And at this point in time, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to stop sharing my screen for right now. Uh, I'll leave this sitting here for a minute for anybody that wants to get that contact information again. Um, but for now, um, I invite folks to Throw your questions this way. I'm going to let Sunshine moderate this part of it. Uh, let her pick which questions to uh, throw my way. I'm Depending on how many questions we get, I'm going to try not to spend too much time answering so we can get to more questions rather than me spending too much time on one at a time. So uh, I'm going to shut up now and stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Richard. That was very informative and great. We really appreciate it. Um, we have had a few more people join and I just wanna put one more reminder in the chat about the sign-in sheet. That is for an opportunity to win the $25 Sportsman's Gift Warehouse gift card at the end of this session. So please take a moment to fill that out. It also helps us track who we are serving um, so we can continue to offer free workshops and programs just like this. So thank you guys. We have a few Q and A's come through and a few in the chat. I'm gonna start with the one in the chat and then move over to the Q and A's. Uh, what is the best artificial lure to use for it says CAPE, C-A-P-E. I don't know if that's supposed to be crappie um, or for bass. Um, yeah. Thanks, for, Robert did, he, he fixed it to crappie. So what's the best artificial lure to use for crappie or bass? Um, the best lure is not gonna be the same for both of them. Uh, crappie fishing, I'm gonna say a small jig head they vary in size from one thirty second ounce up to a quarter ounce but if i was just going to pick one i would pick a one sixteenth ounce jig head with a plastic grub on it there's a huge number of varieties bobby garland is one that's very popular uh there's what's called tube jigs there's crappie magnets uh, but a, one six, a plain one sixteenth ounce jig head um, with a two inch plastic grub on it. Or, um, and for bass, whew, that's a loaded question. Um, and it depends on fishing from shore or a bank. But probably the most tried and true bass lure over all of history, I'm going to say is a plastic worm. Uh, you know, they come in six inch varieties up to 10 inch varieties, but there have probably been more largemouth bass caught on plastic worms collectively than just about every other lure made. So there's a follow up question. What's the best bait for largemouth? And I don't know if that that is a separate question because it is not an artificial lure. So what is the best bait for largemouth bass? Um, if, if you talk about live bait, uh, then either minnows or we often buy what we call large shiners, which are basically a minnow, just like you'd buy for crappie fishing, except they're a little bit bigger. They're usually three to four inches long. We also like to catch our own live bait out of the river using a cast net 
one of those nets that you throw out in the water that we use to catch what's called a thread fin shad. Now, it's a whole different ball game learning how to throw a cast net and where to throw it and when to throw it to catch those thread fin shad. But if you don't have access or the means to do that, the best thing to do is go to the bait shop and buy large minnows or large shiners. Awesome. Any good areas for kayak fishing? Recommendations for where to go kayak fishing at? Yeah, uh, everything I named for bank fishing, you know, Chester Frost Park, that's an extremely popular area because that embayment is often uh, somewhat protected from the wind. Uh, a lot of good habitat in there. Uh, but Harrison Bay State Park, where I talked about Wolf Tever Creek, there's a boat launching ramp right there by that bridge. Uh, a lot of kayak fishermen put in there. Um, and uh, so basically all of those places I named as good bank fishing areas are great kayak areas as well. Yeah, and to follow up with that, because I am a paddler, uh, anywhere, uh, state park with boat ramps, anywhere you can find a boat ramp is and access to the, the river or the lake would be a great place to launch a fishing kayak and fish from. So uh, recommendations and opinion on red eye bass. Uh, yeah, and that one kind of throws me a little bit because red eye bass is one of those common names that can uh, also pertain to different species. So I'm not exactly sure what species you're referring to. Red eye bass is often, by, by what I understand, is also known as Acusa bass, uh, which is found in some of the streams in North Georgia, et cetera. Uh, they, they don't occur naturally in the Tennessee River. So I can't tell you a whole lot about those and uh, because number one, I'm not real familiar with them in our area. And also I'm not 100% sure that the species I'm thinking about is the same species you're thinking about. All right, um, one more in the uh, chat and then I'm gonna move over to Q&A. This one comes from Brent. Uh, what's the best artificial bait for walleye? Um, I hear anything that looks like a minnow. Uh, you know, I mean, walleye like eating minnows. I mean, uh, but a lot of walleye are caught on what's called crank baits or jerk baits, uh, our own spoons, uh, small, you know, two and a half, three inch spoons. Um, depending upon how you're fishing and the technique, uh, I've caught walleye and sauger on quarter ounce hair jigs tipped with a minnow, a toughy minnow, by casting those quarter ounce jigs and bumping them along the bottom. Um, or if fishing from a boat, sometimes we sit down the tailwaters like uh, below some of the dams and you vertical fish very heavy jigs. You need a heavy jig because you're fishing in the current and we'll fish what's called a one ounce football jig. Uh, that you can drop straight down as the boat's drifting and bounce it up and down off the bottom, again, uh, tipped with a minnow. And so, um, thanks for that, Richard. Donna followed up with her question about um, recommendations and opinion on red-eye bass. She followed up and said they are in the Paint Rock River, which I don't know where that is. I am not familiar. So. Yeah, I, I can't tell you exactly where it is, but I've heard about it. And, okay. and that kind of confirms my belief that red eye bass, she's talking about what I know is a coosa bass. Um, and in, in small streams, um, I would probably recommend a rooster tail or a MEPS spinner, a quarter ounce rooster tail or a MEPS spinner. But I know they'll also hit the same small plastic jigs and grubs that people use for crappie fishing you know if you're throwing around fallen treetops in the paint rock river especially uh but since i haven't fished for them a whole lot i'm not going to claim to be an expert but knowing from the stream fishing i'm done i've done you know rooster tails are, are a great lure or a mets spinner uh are small jigs 
Awesome. Thanks, Richard. Um, Sandy Cole asks, what is happening with the sturgeon? Um, what is happening with the sturgeon? Yeah, what's happening with sturgeon? Okay, well, um, a lot of, um, you know, state wildlife agency, federal officials, they've been working real hard for the last 20 years um, trying to reestablish sturgeon, which kind of died out in uh, the Tennessee River, uh, partially due to overfishing, partially due to TVA dams, etc. cetera. Uh, but they are native fish here. So uh, a lot of organizations have been raising sturgeon fingerlings. The Tennessee Aquarium has been cooperating in that. And they've been stocking them for uh, many years now. Most are stocked up around Knoxville, which is kind of more their native habitat. Tennessee Aquarium has released some here. Uh, I saw a presentation. You can't keep them if you catch one. You're supposed to turn it loose. Uh, and report it to the state wildlife agency. Um, last, uh, I heard a presentation last week from one of the biologists who said they've had reports of, I can't remember, it was either four or 500 sturgeon caught in the last several years. Um, so they're starting to get bigger, they're growing, but the majority of them are north of Chattanooga up toward Knoxville. Uh, we only have a few that are down in this part of the Tennessee River. Awesome. Uh, Molly B asks, what are the fish that I should release immediately? Um, I mean, any fish you don't intend to keep and eat, you should release quickly. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of the biologists say you shouldn't keep a fish out of the water for longer than you can hold your breath underwater. Uh, so that kind of gives you a pretty good idea. Um, and uh, if you keep them out of the water too long, sometimes you may release them and they may swim out and swim off. But if they've been extremely stressed, uh, then, uh, you know, they, they still may not uh, survive. And you shouldn't touch their sides with your hands unless you wet your hands first because your dry hands will wipe the protective slime off of them. They have that, they're slimy, fish are slimy uh, for protection. It protects them from bacteria, et cetera. If you wipe that slime off with your hands, then you're opening that fish up to potential infection. Um, all that said, um, just about any game fish, bass, crappie, bluegill, those species, if you're not gonna keep them, you need to release them you know, pretty quickly. You can take a picture with them, sure. I take lots and lots of pictures and we'll keep it out, out of the water for, you know, three, four minutes, you know, while we're taking pictures, et cetera, before we release it. And usually that's not a big deal. Uh, catfish, catfish can actually breathe through their skin. So as long as you keep a catfish wet, they'll live a long time. <laughs> you know, I, I often have clients who think they want to keep catfish and we put them in a live well. And then at the end of the day, they decide, oh, we're too tired to clean fish. We're not gonna keep them and we'll turn them loose. As long as you keep a catfish wet, he, he's a tough little bugger and he can actually breathe through his skin somewhat uh, and uh, they'll last a long time. But other species, bass, crappie, bluegill, uh, those types of fish, you don't wanna keep them out of the water more than you know two, three, four minutes if you can help it. All right, we got one from Angela Dawson. What are good places for fly fishing? Um, anywhere there's water, <laughs> you know. I mean, in, in, anything you can do with spin casting, you can do with fly fishing. Um, and, and again, I'm not a huge fly fisher, uh, but um, wading, uh, a lot of fly fishermen like to wade and, and of course it also depends when you say for fly fishing if you're talking about trout you have to go toward the mountains uh you know toward polk county cherokee national forest that's where most of the trout streams are one of the most popular is the hiawassee river so if you want to uh trout fish by fly fishing the hiawassee river is absolutely one of the best places in our region to go. 
Now, if you want to catch bluegill, you know, or bass or whatever, all of those bank fishing areas that uh, I named are good places to go. The trick with fly fishing is, of course, uh, you've got to have room for your back cast. You know, that fly line's coming back behind you. So um, a lot of times you got to be prepared to get wet where you go to areas that are more shallow and you actually wade out in the water. So you've got room to make a good back cast and uh, throw whatever lure you're going to be using. Popping bugs are great for bluegill. Uh, that's probably one of the most fun things I like doing with a fly rod is using a, a, a little popping bug about that big that floats on the top and you kind of pop it through the water and the bluegill come up and smack it off the top. That's great fun. But so any of the places I named Harrison Bay, Chester Frost, all of those areas are good places for a fly rod, just as much as they are with other fishing equipment. And, and she said, yes, trout, Thank, thanks for all the info. So I think, I think you <laughs> answered her question. All right, ne next one is from Marie Webb. Any good bank fishing spots south of the dam heading near Hailtown? Um, toward Hailtown, uh, down on, you know, the lower end of Nickajack uh, Lake, you know, a lot of people, you know, like to just fish off the rocks along the, uh, what's called riprap along all the highways that surround uh, Nickajack Lake. Um, there's uh, an area called Shell Mound, uh, a TVA park down there. That's a good area. Uh, Marion County Park is a good area. It's back in what they call Brindling Slough uh, is a good area. There's not as much public access area on Nickajack. Uh, just a quick piece of trivia. Nickajack was built before TVA existed. So TVA didn't go buy up a whole bunch of property for public access. Most of the land uh, around Nickajack Lake is privately owned. So the public areas that you find on Nickajack <clears throat> are mostly on the lower end from where they destroyed the Hales Bar Dam and rebuilt Nickajack Dam. Fishing below Nickajack Dam uh, is great bank fishing. Uh, a lot of people catch bluegill bass white bass, uh, there's uh, sovereign walleye, there's good bank fishing downstream immediately below Nickajack Dam. Okay, hopefully that answered your question, Marie. Um, Philip would like to know, what is the easiest type of rod and reel to use for beginners? Probably the easiest and one of the most popular is, you know, what's called a Zebco 202 spin cast reel. Um, you know, there's a lot of first fish caught on Zebco 202s. It comes on a rod and it's a push button release. You use your finger to push a button and as you cast it you release that button and your lure or your bait or your uh, float goes flying out through there. So uh, just buying a Zebco 202 is definitely the easiest rod and reel to learn how to fish with. Awesome. I hope everyone wrote that down. I need to write that down. Um, all right, Dane would like to know, what is the best knot to keep your hooks on? Oh, um, there's so many knots out there in the world, but I will tell you about the only knot I use for virtually any lure or took, uh, or, uh, lure or hook that I'm tying on, I use what's called an improved clinch knot, or some people call it an improved cinch knot. But uh, if you Google how to tie an improved clinch knot, or if you search it on YouTube, you'll find tons and tons of videos that show you how to tie an improved clinch knot. And it's it's basically all I use. Uh, you know, there's dozens of other kinds of knots and some fishermen will say you have to know every one of them. I do not. If you learn how to tie an improved clinch knot, you're good to go for just about anything you're going to do. 
Awesome. All right, Dan, I hope that answered your question. Uh, Jackson Williamson would like to know what type of catfish get the biggest? Uh, the blue catfish get the biggest um, <clears throat> without question. Um, flatheads get big. I can't remember what the state record is on flathead. I want to say it's 80 something pounds, but the state record blue catfish is uh, 112 pounds on rod and reel. And uh, the world record is uh, 140 something pounds. I will show you, I'm gonna share my screen again and I'm gonna show you a picture of a, uh, what a hundred pound plus blue catfish looks like. Just so you know what kind of fish we're talking about here. And then uh, Jessica would also like to know what do blue catfish eat? Okay. While you're pulling that picture up, Richard. Let me figure out, I lost my, oh, there's a share screen. 140 pounds, that, that is very large. That's human size. Oh gosh, you still got me set up to share. Oh, there it is. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> That's a blue catfish that weighs around 105 pounds, give or take. Um, catfish when they get old they're like people they're just like me i don't get any taller but i get bigger around <laughs> and catfish are the same way as they get old uh they they may get a little bit longer but mainly they just get bigger around so that's a hundred pound plus blue catfish um <clears throat> Catfish are what they call opportunistic feeders. They uh, eat anything that comes along, basically. Blue cats mostly eat uh, fish, um, and we fish mostly with cut bait. Sometimes we fish with live bait, um, but they sit in places in the river, and they just wait on stuff to come floating downstream a fish that's died or, uh, or is not real healthy or whatever, or, you know, invertebrates that live on the bottom, they eat mussels, the little clams that live on the side of the river. Sometimes we pull catfish on and you can hit them on the stomach and they sound like a baby rattle because they've got so many of those clams or mussels inside of them. Uh, flatheads are more prone to eat live bait. A lot of bass fishermen catch flathead catfish while they're bass fishing with lures. Uh, they're a little bit more aggressive. Uh, again, channel catfish are also very opportunistic. They'll eat dead bait or cut bait, but they'll also hit artificial lures. We often catch them when we're bluegill fishing because channel cats are known that when bluegill are, are spawning and they're on their beds, um, channel catfish love to come and raid their beds and eat the bluegill eggs. Uh, so while we're bluegill fishing with, you know, worms or jigs or whatever, we'll often catch channel cats because they're in there raiding the bluegill nest. Awesome. Well, we got about 10 minutes and about 11 more questions. So let's put you through the speed round. Okay, Richard. Uh, Andrea Kirkman would like to know what is the best time of year for largemouth? Um, I, I get asked that question a whole lot by clients uh, thinking about booking a fishing trip. And my first question is always, do you want to catch big fish or do you want to catch a lot of fish? Because it's kind of two different time periods. Uh, I showed you that state record from Gabe Keene that was caught in February. Um, some of the biggest bass are often caught very early in the year, February and March. There's probably more trophy bass caught on Chickamauga in February, March than most other months uh, because the big fish typically get active first. They're kind of the top of the pyramid, you know, the king of the roost or whatever, and they start feeding early. Uh, but you're not gonna catch a lot of fish in that time of year, usually. Uh, 
you know, you're out there fishing hard, casting a lot, doing a lot of work, just trying to get what we call the big bite. So February, March is probably the best time for big trophy bass. But if you want to catch numbers <coughs> rather than size, usually start about mid-April. That's when most largemouth bass start spawning here. So from about mid-April through the 1st of June is a lot of times when all bass get most active. Um, and uh, so that's probably your best time period of the year to catch good numbers. That said, no such thing as always or never. Sometimes you can go out there in the July and August and catch a ton of bass as well. You just got to figure out where they are and uh, how to catch them. But uh, those two time periods, February, March for big fish, mid-April through the 1st of June for uh, numbers. Awesome. All right. So a uh, David Lowry posted, Richard, another spot to fish is Dickert Pond at Camp Jordan. It's part of the TWRA community fishing program and we stock it, he says. So there's another uh, bank fishing area for those of you that might be interested located at Camp Jordan. Did you know about that one, Richard? Yeah, I appreciate David pointing that out. Of course, David works for TWRA, so he's doing a little commercial for him. <laughs> That's fine. David. That's all right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Camp Jordan people, I mean, you know, and a lot of fishermen, you know, they'll catch fish, have them in the live well, decide they don't want to keep them or just do it for fun. And they'll drive by Camp Jordan and throw fish in the pond out there. Uh, but I'm, I'm surprised David didn't also mention a lot of people, if you're familiar with Lake Junior, um, the wildlife agency stocks trout uh, in January, February, and I think March. When it's cold, they stock trout in Lake Junior. You're only allowed to fish, I think, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, but they stock about a thousand trout a month in Lake Junior. So if you drive by Lake Junior right now on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you're probably going to see a lot of people gathered around Lake Junior. And the young lady who was asking about fly fishing, you'll see a lot of people out there fly fishing for the trout that they've released in Lake Junior. Awesome. Um, Aaron Cole asked about uh, fishing license requirements for both adults and kids. And David was nice enough to put some links in there um, on the Tennessee.gov TWRA license licenses for fishing. So hopefully that helped answer your question, Aaron. If you have a follow-up question, um, please type it um, if that did not help answer that for you. Um, Paul asked, how deep should you fish per crappie? And somebody answered, a well-known theory is that since crappie eyes are located such that they are always looking up and they don't do not fish below them. So they'll come up for bait, but they won't go down for bait. Is that a good answer to how deep should you fish for crappie? Well, not necessarily how deep, uh, but that's typically correct. Again, no such thing as always or never, but for whatever reason, generally crappie do feed up. Uh, and, and, and if you, you know, if they're holding at a certain level and you're fishing your lure or your bait is below them, deeper than where they are, then yeah, you're probably not going to get as many bites because they do have a preference for feeding up. You can have a lure or a bait, you know, two or three feet higher than they are and they'll come up and get it. But if it's two or three feet below where they are, they're probably not going to go down and get it. And that's because the way their eyes are placed. They just think, can't see as well down as they can up. Um, how fish, how, how deep fish for them? Um, it's, it's totally seasonal. When crappie are spawning um, in uh, late March and the first two or three weeks of April, you can find crappie in a foot and a half of water. Um, you know, a lot of people love throwing a, what's called a float and fly or a jig and float where you have a, a small float and you suspend a, 
16th ounce jig, a foot and a half or two feet beneath that float and cast it out there and just jig it along slowly. And that lure is only about a foot and a half underwater. And that's why a lot of people love to crappie fish and they catch a lot. However, if you go out there fishing right now uh, in wintertime uh, or in the heat of the summer, you're probably going to catch more crappie by fishing structure that's deep, you know, 15, 20, even 25 feet deep. So there's no such thing as always or never, but when they're spawning typically in March and the first half of April, you can fish real shallow. You'll still catch some fish deep, but you can catch them shallow. Other times of the year, you're probably going to need to fish a little deeper mostly. Awesome. Uh, David Lowry wrote that Dickert is currently being stocked with trout and starting in March or April, it will be stocked with catfish. So for those that what want, the, that is the um, place to fish at Camp Jordan. Dickert oh, okay. is currently stocked with trout. Starting in March or April, it will be stocked with catfish. So that's that. Um, Paint Rock River spills into Wheeler below Guntersville Dam, and that may be kind of a follow-up statement to the... Uh, Talking about the red-eye bass. Yes, the red-eye bass. So we'll count that one as uh, answered. Um, David Lowry also wrote, the state record flathead is 85 pounds, 15 ounces. Thank you, David. I, I knew, I was pretty sure it was in the 80 something pound range. Um, what's the biggest fish ever caught? Did, did we already answer that in a different format? The biggest fish ever caught? Um, well, if you start talking about ocean fish, I'm sorry, I have no idea. Um, now, if you're talking about North American freshwater, uh, I'm probably going to say that it's most likely a white sturgeon. I cannot tell you how big it was or is, but to my knowledge, in North American freshwater, white sturgeon are probably the largest fish there are. They're up in the Northeast, uh, and I know they grow to, you know, 10, 11, even 12 feet long, and I know of you know, weighing 300 pounds or in excess of 300 pounds. I don't know a lot about them because obviously I don't live in the Northeast, but to my knowledge, uh, white sturgeon are the largest freshwater uh, fish in North America. All right, uh, Timothy, I'm, I'm not gonna say the last thing because I'm gonna butcher it. What fish are live crickets good for? Uh, Live crickets, that's bluegill bait. <clears throat> that's not to say bass won't eat them uh, or other species, but most people use live crickets for bluegill and shell crackers, etc. Uh, and they're excellent. They're absolutely excellent. Uh, another bait that I love to use for bluegill, and it's what I use almost exclusively at some bait shops, if you ask for wax worms. And I'm gonna tell you a wax worm is a little white worm that's about that long. And they kind of look like maggots, but don't freak out because they're not all slimy and yucky like maggots. When you buy them, they'll be in sawdust and they're real dry and they're real clean, but they are fantastic bluegill bait. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people don't like uh, using live crickets, you know, they don't like handling crickets. Well, waxworm may be a good option. Or, of course, red worms. Red worms are always good as well. All right, so Mark Swain, uh, they're in western North Carolina, and they occasionally get to Chattanooga. They would like to know uh, when would be a good time of the year to find stripers below dams, and what artificial would you recommend? Um, probably the best time of year for catching stripers, uh, also known as rockfish, uh, in TVA Dam tailwaters 
is going to be beginning the last week of March through the first week of May. Uh, that's when they, you know, they're instinctively kind of making spawning runs. Of course, they're a saltwater fish that's been reintroduced to the freshwater, uh, but they migrate genetically out of saltwater and up freshwater rivers to spawn. So they kind of instinctively do the same thing and have a tendency to run upstream when it's time to spawn and hence congregate in the tailwaters. Uh, and uh, from my experience, that happens mostly from the last week of March through about the first week of May. As far as what lure, um, live bait's absolutely the best. If you learn to throw that cast net, cast net and you can catch thread fin shad that are five, six inches long, that's without question gonna be your best striper bait. Artificial lures, you wanna imitate that. You wanna throw a, a, a big white bucktail jig with a big white twister tail on it. Uh, anything that's gonna resemble that five or six inch thread fin shad. One of my favorite kinds of fishing um, is a topwater lure called a red fin. It's a seven inch lure, it's about that long, and you reel it across the top of the water and it wiggles along on top and makes a great big wake. Um, in a lot of the tailwater, stripers don't hit top water uh, a whole lot, but where they do, that's the most exciting form of fishing you'll ever experience is to throw that seven inch red fin out there and bring it past across the top of the water and have a 30 pound striper unload on it it'll Amen. stop it'll stop your heart my wife who has done that just exclaimed from the kitchen amen <laughs> <laughs> oh i like it the peanut gallery kitchen in there um all right a couple more questions what are the best tennessee river areas for white striped hybrid bass and what baits to use uh, that's pretty much the exact same answer as I just gave for the stripers or the rockfish okay. uh, because they're all in the same family. Uh, white bass is a, a native species uh, and they're in the same genus more or less as rockfish or striped bass. Uh, but for the smaller ones, basically you want to size down. You want to fish the same lures uh, the same way, but uh, white bass generally run anywhere from one pound up to three pounds. So they're not going to be real prone to hit a seven inch red fin, but if you size down smaller lure, they're going to be trying to eat bait that's, you know, maybe an inch to two or two and a half inches long. So uh, small white jigs, uh, the rooster tails I talked about, uh, and uh, basically anything that imitates a shad that's the, the, the size that they like to feed on, which for white bass are the hybrids. Uh, hybrids are kind of in between, so uh, just match the hatch. Try to find something that looks like a shad. Awesome. So we've got a bunch of thank yous. Uh, this was informative and fun. Um, there's two more questions I see. Um, one, any hints for kayak fishing and then where is the best bait shop to shop at? I know we kind of touched on the kayak fishing earlier and this may be somebody that joined us a little late. So maybe go for the best bait shop to shop at if you have one and then follow up with that kayak fishing question one more time. Um, well, I, I hate singling anybody out because there's lots of great uh, bait shops in our area. Um, but since I was asked, one of my favorites is Jack's Bait and Tackle. Jack's Bait and Tackle has been here for decades. Um, there's a new one up Highway 58. Uh, Jack's is uh, most centrally located if you're going to fish the tailwaters near Chickamauga Dam. Uh, they're on Bonnie Oaks Drive, not far from Highway 153. But as you go up Highway 58, there's a new one up there. And I'm sorry, I can't remember their name because I don't frequent it a whole lot. Uh, but I know it's, up, I think it's just past uh, Central High School uh, or in the area of Central High School. 
uh, over on the uh, west side of the river, on the Hickson side, uh, Soddy Bait and Tackle is very popular, uh, basically in Soddy Daisy. That's the three that really jump out at me right now. And then, of course, you got all the big box stores, but they don't carry a lot of uh, bait, live bait. You know, some of them may have coolers and worms and stuff in them, you know, but as far as buying minnows and that kind of stuff, uh, they don't carry those. But obviously, they have a great selection of lures, et cetera. And then, uh, any hints for kayak fishing? Any hints for kayak fishing? Since I don't do it, uh, uh, no, I, other than what I talked about is uh, now, you know, just because, I mean, I'm familiar with it, you know, one accessory that I know is very helpful kayak, kayak fishing, I do this because my daughter and my son-in-law like to fish out of their kayaks occasionally, is a small anchor, a small anchor that you can pull up with a, there's a little attachment incher. A lot of times you'll get in an area and if the wind's blowing, uh, you've constantly got to be paddling and it's hard to paddle and keep yourself positioned in the wind when you're, you're trying to cast and then you got to paddle and cast and then paddle. But if you just got that small anchor with you where you can get into an area, just drop your anchor off the back of the boat and then you can just sit there and fish without worrying about, uh, floating around or getting blown around in the wind. Awesome, Richard. Well, we've got a few minutes over, so, and I, I see a few people have dropped off. We saw quite a few people uh, staying tuned in with us. So um, what we can do is we can uh, spin the wheel and uh, see who we want to, or see who's gonna win the sportsman's gift card. Um, and then I have included a link for a survey, just you guys have a moment, let us know how we did tonight, what you liked, what you didn't like, what else you'd like to see us offer, kind of keeps us on our toes and helps us provide engaging interactive workshops and programs for our community. Um, and in this digital age, uh, we, we're reaching people across, across the, the world right now. So I love that. Um, thank you guys again so much for attending. Let's see if I can share my screen. I got this cool thing, um, it's called Wheel of Names, and I've entered everyone's name in here that filled out the sign-in sheet. So we're going to click to spin, and it'll tell us who the winner is tonight. Renaud. I will butcher that last name, but Renaud, you're our winner tonight. Richard, did we have, we had two of them to give out, though, correct? Yes, correct. Two twenty-five dollars right. gift cards donated by Sportsman's Warehouse. All right, we'll remove Renaud since he's won, and we'll spin the wheel again and see who gets the second one. Oh! Got to eat it out. All right, guys, we will send a follow-up email with some information that we shared tonight, um, a survey link so you can let us know how we did. Um, you'll also get a sticker um, in the mail if you filled out the sign-in sheet. And for the lucky Scott and Renaud, you guys are going to receive those Sportsman's Warehouse gift cards so you can go buy some fishing gear and get out and do this activity that you just learned about tonight. Um, if you guys have any follow-up questions, um, please. I saw, I saw one chat question here. Somebody asking if this is being recorded and if it'll be if there'll be a link for it. Y yes, it is being recorded. It is also live on YouTube. We will share that link with you in case you want to re-watch it or share it with somebody you know. Um, in case you found the, the information valuable and do you want to re-watch it, yes, 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 yes. So um, keep your eye out on your email and your mailboxes for all that good stuff. Richard, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with everybody tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad I don't have to teach fishing because it would have been short and dull. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with everybody. Mm -hmm. And a big thank you to uh, Sportsman's Warehouse for that donation so we could reward some of these people uh, that attended tonight. So why don't, you, why don't you tell them real quick about a couple of other workshops you've got coming up as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, and then real quick, if you guys do have any follow-up questions, um, Richard, I, share your screen one more time so they have your contact info, but I'll also include it in the follow-up email that we're gonna send to everybody. If you guys have any follow-up questions, Richard is your point of contact. Um, I'll just make up an answer if I need to. But yeah, coming up um, every other Tuesday, we're gonna be offering free workshops in the same format as you guys saw tonight. Um, we're going to next um, workshop coming up is uh, Wilderness Survival Shelter Building 101. That will be on February 9th. After that, we're gonna have Camp Cooking 101 on February 23rd. And then in March to round it out, we're gonna have Backpacking 101 and Bike Maintenance 101. So um, if you guys are interested in those, you can find it on our Facebook page, Outdoor Chattanooga, our website, outdoorchattanooga.com. You can register through Eventbrite. Um, be sure to go follow and like us everywhere so you can find out about more of the things that we're offering and doing. Um, Richard, again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with everybody tonight. We appreciate everyone that attended and we look forward to seeing you out, out there fishing. Thank you very much. It was great okay. fun. Email me. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. We will see you all soon. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate you. Sure. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah, it was good. Turned out really well. All right, David, I will email you. I'm going to jot your email down. Weird H. Wow. All right, I'm gonna end this, Richard. Thanks again.